We're in Romans chapter 14. It's going to be our starting point, and either I get to it tonight morning or not, I have uh, I have uh, 55 pages of notes. I'm not sure how far I get. Can you expect us to write out 55 pages? But we will. <laughs> we will. I will. I will. I will continue this lesson for a couple of weeks. <laughs> the question that we come to this morning is. Whoa! Did I do that? What happened? I took the lid off. That is not good. I can't leave the lid off these times. How many What happens? What happens when you die? Here is. Here is. Here is. Here is. Here is, I looked up and they estimate that 108 billion have lived and are, have and are living. Guess how many of them are going to die? All of them. All are going to die. The question is, what happens when you die? I'm going to deal this morning with what is called the doctrine of the doctrine of eschatology. S C H A T O L O G Y. Eschatology. And that is the doctrine of last things are the end time. Last things. Oh, that's a. Uh, I'll have that written in a few minutes. The title of the message could be The Certainty of Future Judgment. The Certainty of Future Judgment. The Certainty A future <coughs> judgment. And we're going to look at the judgment it's called the seat of Christ. And the application is motivation motivation for a God pleasing. life the motivation for a God pleasing life the motivation for a God pleasing life Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 in our continuing study 
But you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Romans 10, 14, 14, 10. For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of God. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of God. Every one of those 108 billion people will give an account of our lives to God. No one lives in a vacuum. No one lives unaware of God. No one will escape God's final judgment on every single person who's ever been alive in this world for all time. I would be more fearful of the coming judgment of God then I would have any fear for anything temporal. I'd live more in fear of the final judgment of God than I live in fear of what could happen to me in the next five minutes. Our corresponding course verse is going to be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll look at it in a few moments. Notice it says in Romans 10, 14, so I can keep you up with the context that Paul is speaking. But, Paul says in verse 10 of Romans 14, 10, the but contrasts the incompetent judgment of a brother with the judgment of this one Lord. You are incompetent in making a judgment about the condition of another brother, Christian. Paul says you have no really real insight into the heart of another Christian brother more so than God does. Why do you judge your brother? And it's talking about a believer. Probably the use of both judge and show contempt. Why are you showing contempt in your judgment? Is meant to have application to both the strict and the free individual. A.T. Robinson favors this is direct to the conduct of a weaker brother in Romans 4, 3, in either case. So the attitude is wrong because we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and God will give an account. We will have to give an account of our lives to God, not to each other. You're not going to stand in front of the preacher to give an account of your life. You will stand in front of God to give an account. Can I tell you what changed my life as a teenager? You know what shook me up when I was a young person? Was sitting in Fred Henson's class when I was in the 10th grade, sitting on the second floor, sitting on the third seat in the third row, and he was preaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10 that I was going to have to give an account to God for my behavior. That shook me up. In the end, all that matters in the spiritual realm was what God thinks about my salvation. Now believe me, in the physical world, you have to give an account to people in the secular world. That's for sure, but not for your salvation. And we are talking about Christians judging other Christians 
because they do things that we don't particularly like, we are not to put them in condemnation because they may go to a movie and we don't like movies. If another person uses another translation, I am not to sit in condemnation. They never got saved because they're not using the right translation. We cannot bring into judgment another person standing with God. Only God can bring that person into right standing with himself. The free Christian found it easy to show contempt against his brother regarding him as an upright, legalistic, goody-good. Essentially, Paul answers is, Stop worrying about your brother. <coughs> You have enough answers before you you have enough to answer for God before Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to give an answer to Jesus Christ for my behavior. It may take a while. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to take place. Notice it says, but you. It is it referring to you, not someone else? Like the lady came out the door on Sunday morning a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago, and says, "Man, I'm sure glad you preached that sermon because my friend needed to hear it." And I said to myself, "You is the one I was preaching to." First, in the sentence for emphasis, and is connected contrast to the Lord. You, in contrast with the one the Lord judge of all. You are not to be the one who's going to do the judging. You are not the one who does the judging in contrast to the Lord. In fact, our common responsibility is to Him. How dare we judge each other? The phrase you brother is another reason for not judging it is inconsistent with a recognition of the brotherhood of the believers we're all in Christ we're all in Christ it is but as for you in contrast to the Lord why do you the weaker brother judge your brother and despising and judging fellow Christians and frowning upon contemporary judgment are both shown to be totally a wrong attitude. Why? Not only because God has accepted them. Listen, if a person's been saved, you can't say, well, I never would save them. There are a lot of people that I would have thought, I would never save that person. <laughs> the last person in the world I'd ever want to save is that person, that person that God saved. If God has accepted them to be in the brotherhood of Christ, who might argue? If God has blood-bought, redeemed you by His precious blood, then God saw fit to save that person, not based upon what you thought of that person, but because of what He did for that person. <coughs> not only because God has accepted Him, because Christ has died and risen to our common Lord, but also because they and we are related to one another in the strongest possible way. 